Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to Speaking from Experience. Uh, we got a great program. I appreciate all of you coming out tonight on this cold night. Um, I just have one commercial message uh, before uh, I introduce our speaker, and that is uh, next week uh, starts the uh, elevator pitch competition on Wednesday. I can recognize a number of you in the audience. I know I've signed up, and I know you're feeling extremely confident about your chances uh, in the competition. So uh, that starts on the 19th and then on the 26th. The following Wednesday is the finals in the auditorium, which of course is a big hoopla event. And of course, the finalists <coughs> will feel tremendous pressure at that time. But anyway, enough of that. Tonight, we have a real treat uh, in our entrepreneurship series. Uh, we have Josh Murphy, uh, who's going to talk about his experience uh, building uh, unparalleled productions. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to say much about Josh, but I just think in his bio there's some really interesting stuff. So he goes to UVM. What you major in? Natural resources. Well, of course, natural resources. <laughs> uh, an obvious uh, uh, good training ground for, for film. Uh, gets out, a uh, great skier apparently, becomes a, a pro skier, you know, uh, which is sort of a sort of an upmarket ski bum, I guess, right? That's, but, that's exactly um, what And he's doing a little teaching, as, uh, teaching in school. And then along the way he says, he and his buddies say, Let's, why don't we buy one of these movie cameras because we love shooting all our video and so they buy some old camera on eBay and boom, <laughs> spin forward, what? 15 years, 20 years? 15 years. 15 years. 15 years. And Josh has a really nifty uh, film production company, does commercial work, uh, does feature films. And I haven't seen the river wide, but I'm interested. I love fly fishing. I'm going to watch that. I love the, uh, yeah. th this guy's a very good actor. You got Zach Guilford. Yeah. Zach Guilford yeah. from uh, Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights, yep, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so, so to fill in all the blanks and to share his insights, here he is. Let's have a warm welcome. <laughs> thank you. Josh Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And thank you for Munir for putting me in touch with you. And thank you, Michael Jagger, for putting me in touch with Munir yeah. and Bob. So uh, this is a funny story. Well, first of all, I want to say ground rules here. This is not going to be a presentation. This is going to be a dialogue. So at any time, if you have any question, throw the hand up, and I'm going to stop. This is, this is just as much about, hey, how did you make that? Or how did you figure that out? How, because one thing I've found throughout my career is that there's not enough dialogue. There's not enough mentorship in film. There's a seeming kind of uh, high place that filmmakers achieve, and they're not as readily uh, available for people who are coming up. And you feel like you're always left to your own devices. And you have to figure it out, and you have to make lots of mistakes. And mistakes are good, but there's no such thing as a bad question. So at any time, please say, well, hold on a second. Let me see that again. So uh, let me start out with, with kind of the full disclosure. As he said, I went to UVM. Uh, at that time, Champlain College was not at all what it is today and what I know it to be today. That it, at that time, it was just kind of like this other college that was down the road. And now that what I have found out about Champlain is really, really exciting. And the combination, the crossroads, if you will, between kind of practical hands-on approach as well as uh, regular liberal arts learning, to me, is very exciting. And I think as, as an experiential learning myself, myself who needs to kind of get his hands dirty, I wish I had more of that. And uh, so you guys should count yourself lucky to be able to do that. Um, we're all here to learn, right? We're all here to learn about film. We're all here to learn about filmmaking, just at Champlain, and maybe a little bit from this evening. So there's plenty of inspirations I can share, but make sure you're always true to yourself in finding out what your inspirations were. As Bob said, I, was, I earned a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in science. I got out of that and realized, wow, I don't think I want to do this. Even though I still love science, I love the, the adventure of it, I realized that I needed something that was more creative, more day-to-day -day creative, more adventure, if you will. And I took a various silly paths, which we'll cover very quickly, to get where I am now. But I want to show you one image here. I have a couple images. We're going to watch mostly clips. But uh, 
that I think sums up my career to date better than any words I could use. <laughs> Somebody just showed me this, and I think it's the most telling of what life really is and what success is. You don't get on the elevator and go straight to the top. There's a lot of twists and turns along the way, and things come up, and you adapt, and your life serves up things you never thought you would see before, and you adapt to them, and you keep moving forward. But there's only one person I know, a very close friend of mine, one of my oldest friends, who got on the elevator at the bottom in a job in Wall Street. And he was kind of a ladies' man. And he was dating, a, was dating a girl and met her father. And her father said, I'll give you a job. He said, great. Soon later, they broke up. He started working in this company. He was there his entire career until the company sold. And he's still with the company. It's the one person I know that got on the elevator and went from the bottom to the top. It doesn't happen that way. You're going to have a lot more twists and turns. So that's what makes life interesting and makes life fun, though. So that's really the, the, uh, the dirty part, where things kind of get interesting and you learn from it. As long as we learn from those twists and turns and don't just take it as an affront to your belief of how you're going to get from A to B. So for creativity, and if you look at the way this thing twists and turns, there should be no boundaries. So I'm imagining that everyone here is studying something in the creative world, but you might be even studying economics. And if that's the case, great, because there's lots of crossovers. Shared inspirations. Creativity has no boundaries. Creativity is about recognizing convention and using it or subverting it to challenge thought and perception. You need to look no further than your shoes to understand this. I bet if I had polled everybody here as to what shoes you would buy, there would be more people in this room that would buy Nike than New Balance. It has nothing to do with the quality of the shoes. It's your perception. It's the way you feel. And film is about feeling, as is marketing, as is advertising about feeling. When friends ask me what I do oftentimes, I kind of have to describe myself as an emotional architect. Because my job is to take image, music, and story and create a feeling that twists perception. That's what advertising does every single day. That's what storytelling should do. Uh, I had a friend of mine that was a banker, still is a banker. And I described to her what I did, old friends. And she said, just tell me what you do day to day. And I said, this is what I do. This is how, this is how it works. And she goes, that sounds terrible. You have to be creative every day. And I said, yes. And she's like, oh, I couldn't imagine. So you realize some people don't want to take this route. They want to take a much more straight and narrow path. If you're on a creative path, it will be twisty, and it will be turvy, and it'll be up and down, and emotionally so. Because to be able to construct emotion, we have to feel emotion. And we have to be very sensitive to it. And that's why oftentimes we see people in the creative fields kind of swinging around. And then you see people like Philip Seymour Hoffman that just swung a little too far. But that's because it's raw. People are trying to find that way to convey raw emotion. But that said. I have another friend who started as a potter, sold pottery out of the back of his station wagon in New Jersey, finally did some calculations and said, I don't think I can throw enough pots in a day that I could sell in a week, that I can make enough money in a month to feed my family, two young kids. He went back to school, studied business, came out of business, and worked his way up to the chairman of Credit Suisse Bank, one of the biggest banks in the world. So that's creativity as well. I still don't know how, how he did that, how he went from Potter to chairman of Credit Suisse. But he said, you know what? There's no boundaries. Let's not set boundaries. I'm just going to find a new way forward. So if there's anything I'd leave you tonight, it's hopefully the realization that you can be successful in a creative venture, but it's going to be much more challenging than possibly in other professions. So to that end, how did I get here? Uh, as I said, very circuitous road. So let me tell you a story that was kind of set me on my track, I guess, if I had to look backwards. When I was 13 years old, I had a very close friend who was at that time 101. His name was Uncle Ed to everybody in the community. He was a friend of mine's great uncle, still living. And I remember thinking, wow, he must have some insight. He actually had two PhDs in math and philosophy. And I used to go just sit with him in the summers. He would sit with his book and read voraciously. And I remember finally saying to him, Uncle Ed, if you had to pass on one bit of knowledge to a younger generation, what would it be? And he said, nothing. He said, ah, well, wait a minute. He thought for a second. He said, 
okay, there's two things I'd pass on. I sat there kind of wrapped. And he said, find your own truth. Don't let anybody tell you what you should do. You have to find your own truth. And I said, woo. He said, there will be people that will tell you you have to do this. You have to do this. You must do this. But you have to listen to your inner voice and think about the path you'd like to take to success and see if they line up. And sometimes you're going to veer off again. But find your own truth. So if I can tonight share how I got here, I'll just basically, in a nutshell, go from the time he told me to find my own truth till now. So before a career, <laughs> this is where it gets kind of funny. Before a career in film, as Bob had said, I was a professional skier. At the time, it was free heel or telemark skiing. And it had just come up as a sport that actually warranted people putting a lot more time into it than they probably should have been, like I did. Uh, spectacular journey in redefining what could be possible on free heel skis. I was also, at that time, a competitive kayaker or adventurer of sorts. And I tried traveled all over, kind of feeding this passion, that one side of me. But I was always interested in science and art. So I had kind of these three things in front of me. Uh, my first, school out of, the first job out of school, actually, was at Mount Man Mansfield Academy in Stowe. And it was a ski academy, which is perfect, because I could teach, could teach science, could drive a bus, help kids learn how to ski. And soon after that, it was working at Pine Ridge with my friend Marcy, who was in the office. Because Pine Ridge was a school for learning disabled kids, and I am dyslexic. And from an early age, I realized that that changed the way I saw the world. Because the world was a big puzzle, and I couldn't figure it out. But I was going to. I was going to figure out some way to figure it out, even though I knew that, wow, it seems so easy for everybody else. But that defined how I was going to get there. So soon after that, I was working for what's called, uh, was at that time, the Academy Adventure Quest. We first year, with some of the top junior whitewater kayakers, we drove from Woodstock, Vermont, to Honduras, and kayaked all through Mexico with high school students. And I loved it. But I also realized that I wanted to go further. So I went back to school for a master's degree, because that's what you're supposed to do. And I thought science was the way. I had some inspirations when I was younger. Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau, to me, was the most amazing thing one could be. He adventured. He used science to find out new, exciting places. And he was always questioning what's next. So I had, at that time, when I was much younger, Two inspirations. I was either going to be Jacques Cousteau or a professional hockey player. Topping out at whopping 5'6 and 150 pounds, professional hockey player was really not in the cards for me. <laughs> so I chose science. And I said, hey, I can take these things along the way, but you know, maybe I can't take a check from a 250 pounder. It's OK. But that has provided me a unique talent, a talent to kind of figure out how, at every step of the way, I can adapt what I've learned and apply it to where I'm going. So three things that I would say are elements to success. We're going to get past all this stuff and get some watching stuff, too. But the three things that I would say are talent, network, and grit. And I thankfully have the gift of grit. I have some talent, and I've had to nurture that talent. And I've had to use all of my varied background to get where I am and learn and question and always try to get better. Network is the friends that you find yourself amongst or you make for yourself. We, it's been said that we're defined by the five closest people to us. Surround yourself with really good people that challenge you. If friends that don't challenge you can be friends, but if you want to take a group of people that are going to move you forward, make sure that you're pushing them and that they are pushing you. Because otherwise, you'll find that you just kind of you, you, you relax. We all do this. So establish a network early. Because that network will grow. When you leave here, and you graduate, and you go on, all these people that you know now are going to start their network. And you're going to have your network. And like no other time, you have a network that we could never, I could never imagine having. And you have the ability to foster that network and share with that network and say, this is what I did. Show me what you did. This is where I'm going. What do you think? Constantly challenge one another, because you'd be amazed if you keep up that really active discussion how much stuff comes just from sharing and comparing. And you have social networks. I mean, we had a telephone with a long cord. 
you know, when we had a private conversation, it was Ron with Corner, and you talk like this. You guys have more ways to communicate than ever. So keep those up. And then grit. Grit is something that you have to find within yourself. It's that monster that's inside you that drives you, that picks you up when you're down. It's the inner voice that constantly yells at you to, to get better, to try harder. It's the drive to succeed in the face of failure. And as a guy who was dyslexic, I failed a lot. And I realized quite early, failure can define you if you learn from it. Use those failures. And somebody once recently just said, don't afraid to suck. Because if you can learn by something you did that you realize afterwards was no good, you can do so much better. But a lot of people look at something that was no good and they run away from it. They don't ever want to visit again. Look at the things that you did terribly and learn from them. And you'd be amazed how quickly you can adapt and move forward. So, I go to graduate school, right? I meet my wife there, I start a family there. Biggest adventure of my entire life. I get out of school. I start working as a fisheries biologist. Thankfully, my wife said, I want to go back to school to be a teacher. And we're moving to the Lake Tahoe area so I can get a teaching credential. And I said, ah, I can ski again. So I got a job with uh, a local fisheries, uh, local conservation organization. And started working in this job. I thought, oh my god, this is terrible. I have to do something different. And so enter a group of knuckleheads from Norway. Two guys that happened to be spending the winter in Lake Tahoe. And I had always wanted to make a film. And at that point, I bought a 16 millimeter Bolex camera off of eBay. There it is in the upper right corner. Can't see it so well, but hand crank, 16 millimeter film, 50 feet of film, which is about three and a half minutes per roll. So you crank it up, and it spins up a spring, and you pull a trigger, and then you let it go when you want to stop. Pull the trigger, let it go. And so at the time, all of the major guys that were making ski movies were making in film, even though video was just on the rise. And I thought, well, if I'm going to try to do a good job at showing what's possible in this sport, I have to do what the big guys are doing. I can't make this in any lesser format. So my friend Adam Delorier from Vermont showed me how to use 16 millimeter film. And this was his lesson. OK, film goes around here, and then just turn this little dial on the front to 16 and pull the trigger. You're good. <laughs> I had no idea what aperture was. I had no idea what anything was. I knew I got these guys and the other people that I compete with. I'm just going to go out, follow them, and find a story. Find something that kind of explains what this sport is to so many people that defines it. Because at that time, we knew what an alpine skier was. We knew what a snowboarder was. But what the hell was a free heel skier or a telemark skier? Nobody knew. So we had to kind of say, all right, let's, let's, let's find a new boundary. Let's do this. And I said, we've got a clean slate, so let's come at this with a different direction. At that time, the ski movies were all about the athlete and the segment. So it was basically a music video with one athlete. The athlete could then use that to sell his or her sponsors on that they had been in this movie. And I said, well, we don't have athletes that are really at that level yet, so why don't we tell a story? So in walks one of the first stories we told, and I'm going to show you. And if you guys want to see more after we do some of this, tell me, and we'll watch more. So this was kind of. A new thing at the time. How can we tell a story with a format that had never really been described in the past? So I said, OK, well, I'm going to go back to what I learned in high school. I had a really amazing English teacher, Mama Marie. And she said, to tell a good story, you got to have a hook. So for me, this was the hook at the beginning. you got to keep us guessing what's going to happen, right? And you got to engage us emotionally with the characters. And that's where. I'm going to just jump off topic for a little bit. That's where I ran out of interest in making ski movies after six years of doing just that. Because I was losing emotional interest with the skiers. The, the, the story seemed to be told and told and retold over and over. And I wanted to get somewhere else. And so Mama Marie also said a couple other things. She said, in telling a good story, you're going to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And it's right. She's absolutely right. And the other one she told me, which I love to this day, is that a good story is like a mini skirt. It's long enough to cover the goods, but short enough to keep it interesting. 
And I think if, if we all approach storytelling, especially in this day and age where our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, we're now making minute and a half commercials that are long commercials. 30 seconds still the short, but now there's 15 second commercials. I made a 15 second commercial for Men's Warehouse. I thought, who the hell watches 15 second commercials? The thing played over and over and over. I was like, 15 seconds? How do you tell a story in 15 seconds? So always challenge yourself to kind of tell a good story. So let me ask you this. Do you want to see more or do you want to tell more? Questions? Ideas? OK. So getting back here quickly, this is me when I learned how to shoot the bigger version of that other camera. It was all kind of a process of how do we learn? How do we, because there was, I, went, I didn't go to film school. You guys have a pitch fest, an elevator pitch fest. I would have loved to have that. Because I'll tell you, today, that's more relevant than ever. Because with short experience, or short attention spans, we need to be able to get to the point. Bang, bang, bang. This is how I, funny enough, got an opportunity to become a, a producer for ESPN. There was a local adventure race. And somebody told me about it. And I get hired on as a camera guy. And I said, well, hey, you know, I happen to scuba dive and stuff too. So why don't you just throw me over the side of the boat? And I'll swim at water level and swim under. And they said, oh, OK, that would be great. So I did that. And then they threw me into white water. I was like, no problem. So that's my feet there in the front of the boat, pop out through that. And they came back and said, this is great. They gave us more than what we wanted, which is what I always try to do. Give the client more than what they thought they were going to get. And with that, they said, we'd like you to be a producer on a show. And the show is called Get Wild. Get Wild with Cindy Garrison. So. Without further ado. Yeah, so that speaks for itself right there. <laughs> and then I went one step farther. And we went to, and I, I, I say this jokingly, because they're interesting characters, but they're train wrecks. And people like train wreck TV. And so, all right. If they like Trainwreck TV, we'll give them Trainwreck TV. So I'm going to one-up that, too. OK, here we go. <laughs> We're going to double down here. One second. So and the reason I'm showing you this is that these are what I consider the hone your skill period, which is that is this at all interesting to me? No. Did it pay the bills and did it allow me to understand how best to produce programming and how to really get done what the client wants done? You bet. But during that time, you had to kind of suffer through stuff like this. And suffer is a, is a funny word because there's, there's learning in all of this, but uh, you know, at this cost. All right, enough of that, right? So then, you know, once you've gone that far and people say, hey, we like what you're doing, you ultimately end up in a place not unlike this. <laughs> Let's see. Actually, now I'm going to show you guys the private version of this because we can. This is a. A sizzle reel. A sizzle reel is a condensed version of a full uh, episode that you use to pitch a program. So this is a program that I was the executive producer of that we sold to HDNet. And it's about the Mustang Ranch, which is the first legal brothel in the United States. And I thought, why the hell am I telling this story? I have zero interest in this until I met the owners. And the owners became the reason it was interesting to tell. Here's the story. OK, so are those good characters? Do we, even though none of us want to run a brothel, are we totally involved in watching what's going to happen? I was when I met these people, because I said, you're going to be, how you be kidding me? How do you do this? And so making the show, while I learned all about how a brothel works, was really about developing characters and about telling a rather unappealing story, albeit you know, 
interesting visually <laughs> at one level uh, in a way that we could all connect to. So what do we say? We said everybody that runs a business, everybody that's worked for somebody understands how this works. So we're going to tell the story. And so we won't watch the whole thing, but here's how, here's the pitch. Ready? All right. Okay, there's enough of that one. <laughs> so again, as I say, I am not interested at all in the brothel business, but it's a good story. And if you can tell a good story, you can let people learn about something that they never would have thought that they might be interested in. I was never one of those interested in. Now it's kind of interesting. Um, but I want to show you a couple other things. So while this kind of uh, darker period is happening, there was still the interest in telling good stories. And throughout that, I tried to find fun stories that I could tell on my own. F stories that I didn't need somebody else's approval. Stories that I could write, produce, direct, shoot, and I could still feel good about the message. So this is one that uh, when Schwarzenegger was uh, the governor, he tried to close all the state parks. And Maddie actually helped write this one. Um, I was kind of frustrated that government was going to not allow us to use our open space, because I'm a big fan of open space. So I said, hey, you know what? Let's come up with three commercials that we'll make on our own to say, hey, we don't agree with this. So here's one of them. This commercial and the other two that went with it, which I'll show you quickly, cost a whopping $65 to make. And that's because tools and friends that believe in you are inexpensive. And remember that. Today we can do amazing things because tools are inexpensive, but you still need somebody to believe in you. And you've got to sell them what your idea is, and you've got to tell them why it's going to be fun for them to be involved. So these silly little pieces that we made, that in our backyard, the others in the woods behind the house, ended up providing an entree to the actual California State Parks Foundation. They saw this, they played it internally, and it led to me getting a contract with them to make official pieces. So don't ever, don't ever consider your work to be unvaluable. Show your work to people. Share your work. Even if it's something that's a little odd, a little off, share it. Be courageous enough to share it. Because sometimes we would be a little bit nervous that this might you know, get a couple people upset or it's not my best work. Share it. Because you never know where it can go. So additionally at the time, as I say, I was working with friends. Lots of friends. But specifically a couple group of us that really relied on one another. And through that group of friends, we were able to make this, which you probably know this band pretty well. All right, so just a little bit of how this gets done. My good friend travels with the fray. I give him my dad's Super 8 camera that I shot ski movies with. And he films all of this stuff as he's traveling with them. And then he and I get together to shoot the big, huge concert, this one that's there, 20,000 people. And we shot it in full color because we needed a color in black and white melt. And that's the type of thing that you get by fostering that group of people, that collaborator, that person that you can rely on to try to help them when they have an idea and they help you when you have an idea. So keep that active. Keep finding people, as I say, that you can work with because they will give you more opportunities than you bet. Here's one that we did. This is kind of funny. Just a quick one. This is one that uh, having a daughter that was driving and recognizing what the the uh, issues are and how dangerous driving can be, we decided to make a little spoof. True fact, more teenagers are killed by cars than guns. So it's technically safer to give your daughter a gun than a car, which is absurd. But absurd points are good. Because again, going back to storytelling, it's got to have a hook. And you've got to keep them engaged. And they have to say, why did I just sit through 60 seconds of this? 
They, it was actually a competition. Oh. And we entered it in the competition, and we did not win. And I, I have a pretty good idea as to why, but you know, bridge down and gun, putting the two together. Didn't show the product. <laughs> exactly. So, but again, that's another one of those where, yeah, we probably ruffled some feathers, but you're going to ruffle feathers. If you want to get your work out there and you want to get things seen, you're going to have to take a couple of risks. So I'm going to swing back now through this crazy route to feature film, which I'm sure all of you that are here have some aspiration of making a feature film. I certainly did. When I started making ski movies, I thought, you know, the, the pinnacle of artist, artistry is feature film. And just as a word of caution, that's changing radically right before our eyes. The whole format of sitting down for two hours and watching something is changing right now. If you watch Breaking Bad, if you watch Downton Abbey, if you watch any of the top shows out there, you realize that these are 13-hour movies, that they are the new way of storytelling. We're not constrained by an hour and a half or two hours. And most of us don't have time to sit down and watch two hours anyways. So feature film is still a tremendous level of artistry where you can sit people down and tell them to be quiet for two hours and make something. So very quickly. Now, just quickly, to put things in perspective, this movie was over $2 million to make. I doubt it if it'll ever make its money back. And that's a reality of filmmaking today. That was not my $2 million. I was a co-producer and second unit director. So all these pretty shots, all the fish shots, I was able to direct those. But the people that made the movie spent a lot of money. And I don't think they're going to get back. And that is what filmmaking is today. The normal independent film today is being made for $200,000 to $500,000 and being sold for just a couple hundred thousand dollars more than that, if at all. In Sundance this year, the New York Times quoted, of the 4,000 films, I think it was 4,000, that were submitted to Sundance, they estimate the collective cost of those films to make was over $3 billion. Less than 2% will ever see a return. So think about the realities. Less than 2% of three billion. I'm not gonna take those odds. Unless it's just the right story. Unless you realize how to make a film. Unless you realize how you can be creative enough and know the tasks enough that you can decrease the costs as much as possible. So filmmaking, when you reach this level, you realize it's no longer a meritocracy. And by that I mean the best filmmaker does not always get the chance to make the film. It's the person who has the biggest network. Network to money, network to cash network to cast. In fact, there's a little cycle that we say, the cast, cash, cast, cash. If you have a great film and you can't find money, but you can find cast, somebody else will put the money in because they believe that cast member can sell your film. But if you have a great film with money, you'll hire the cast member that will get more money. So it's this crazy little cycle, but it all starts with a lot of money. And that's why for me, although I love telling feature, I only put my foot into that every, some, every once in a while is too big of a risk. And it's a beautiful art form, but it's extraordinarily costly. And in fact, Orson Welles said famously once, if you want to be a painter, you need canvas and a brush, a couple paints. If you want to be a writer, you have to have paper, pen, and some ideas. If you want to be a filmmaker, you need an army and a bank. And he's not wrong. So we have these cheaper tools, and we have these ways, these platforms for distribution that are free online. But Michelangelo did not become a better painter because paintbrushes got cheaper. It's because he studied, and he worked, and he observed, and he constantly challenged himself. And so I would put that to you. Whatever form you take, commercial, short form, long form, challenge yourself to get better. And learn every aspect. So you, you, there's no way you can do it all, but learn as much as you can. And it's a lot to learn. It's a lifelong pursuit of learning. But that's what makes it fun. So remember, how do you make it in this? Talent, connections, grit, and never, ever give up. Set your sight on a goal. Be flexible enough to let life happen that serves you up opportunity. Because there's one thing for certain in life. There is no certainty. Let the love of art and making things drive you to create your best. Then look past it and find the next level that you never thought achievable. Remember that first slide, success is not a one-way upward slope. You're going to take lots of turns. And if you're wondering what Uncle Edwin 
said to me for the second bit of advice, which was equally profound for a 13-year-old at the time. I sat and I wondered, wow, how does he top that one? He just looked at me and goes, find your own truth and keep your pants on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so any questions? Anybody want to see anything else? If you want to know how it got made, open book, full disclosure. If you want to go out and brave the cold, please do so as well. I have a question. I thought you're, uh, at the end when you, the, uh, you talked about the triangle, people, uh, the actors, yeah. the money, yeah. and the, but the idea, the right. film, right. that's very much like any entrepreneurial venture. If you've got a good team and an idea, you'll get the money. If you've got a, a good idea and some money, you can hire. It's, it's, a, it's a very good uh, analogy, not just for that business, but for any business. Right. And does everybody know, just for cura out of curiosity, how in film ownership works? Do you know what the producer and the director and all other stages do? So just so you know, in a classic format, the producer would buy or license the intellectual property, i.e. the script. Sometimes that just came from a writer. And then they would attach a director to it. So now the producer owns the script or licenses the script, attaches a director. And then collectively, the producer and the director come up with the cast that they want to attach to the property. And in doing so then, they can attract more money. So oftentimes films don't have all their money together, but they have enough to get it started, the sacrificial lamp. And the producer brings that money in either by themselves or most often with a group of investors. And they attach a director that has a track record, normally, not always. And then the director, kind of like the coach, hires all the people under him, the director of photography the art director, the, then the producer hires the UPN, the Universal Unit Production Manager, the accountants. And so it begins to staff up, not unlike any organization. And it's run as would be a small company that's only going to be in business for a month of production and then a few months of post. Most films, by the way, are shot in independent films less than 30 days. 24 days is the norm. So just recognize how that works. In TV, just so you know, a producer is not the guy that owns the property. The producer is the quote unquote director, but there are many producers. The executive producer owns the property. So when, when, you, when I go to the movies now, yep. you see there's everybody and their mother is the producer. You know, sometimes the actors are producers. Right. And then the other thing that's not just new, but at the beginning of the movie, there's like, you know, 20 different cool sounding corporate names, Amblin Entertainment yes. and yes. Searchlight. Yes, Hollywood. exactly. What's that? Those are all people that have an equity stake in the film. So if I, Unparalleled Productions, put together a film, if I say, well, I'm going to finance 25% of it or 50% of it, it's Unparalleled, Unparalleled Productions presents in association with Bob Block Films, right? JDK. Those are all people that said, I'm going to bring value to it. And that could be, and that's why sometimes the cast members are producers. The cast member says, I'll put myself in there. I normally get a million bucks to be in this. I'll do it for $10,000. But you're going to give me a producer credit, and I want an equity stake. So they ask for points on the back end when the film sells, that they make money when it sells. And so it's all trying to establish ownership. But now, thankfully, the PGA, Producers Guild of America, has just finally put their little letters at the end of each producer of three that are the primary producers. Because the Academy Awards only recognizes three producers when they award a producer which is best film. Right? Film of the year goes to three producers. And so that production has to say who those three producers are, the primary producers. The rest of them are all people that did something in kind or gave additional money. Normally that goes to executive producer. But it's good to know. It's good because for you folks now coming out, if you see a film that you love and you want to work on a film like that, there's three names to get in touch with instead of 20 names. Those are the people you have to start knocking on doors and finding out through your network who knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that can get you into an introduction. Because those are the three people that make the decisions. The rest of them are all players, but they don't make the decisions. Just one more. Yeah. So what, what's, the, 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 uh, what's most of your work today? Is it Television production or commercials or, or most well, of it's commercials. Okay. Most of it's commercials and, and action uh, companies. I, I noticed on your website you have a 
a lot of your uh, clients are like. Yeah, uh, exactly. So here's, here's something, for example, that uh, I would do today, which I, how I got here, I'll never know. But it's fun. This is Men's Warehouse has another brand that's called KNG Fashion Superstore. And so this is a funny story with this one, too. It's a very short piece. This was a, a commercial that we shot to a totally different script. And at the end of the day, one of the models happened to be a really good dancer. And we said, OK, we have one minute left before we go overtime. But you don't want to go overtime, because you got to pay everybody more money. We have one minute. We have our 30-second song plays twice. We said, you have two songs. Go dance. So we set up two cameras and said, dance. That whole thing took one minute. So we had shot an entire day, a 10-hour day. And they used what we shot for something, but that became the better piece that was made they in one minute. That What's that? They ran that. that was, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So that was, you just, that's another, if you see an opportunity, take it. If you see somebody that's doing something, I was just doing this piece. I just got back from a three-week trip that was all commercial trip. And this one woman was a pharmacist. It was all pharmacy spots. And this woman was from Hawaii. She made, moved to the mainland when she was 18. And she started telling us about why she wanted to live in the mainland and, and what it was like to be a pharmacist in Utah, in this little tiny town of Utah. And so, of course, she's playing Hawaiian music at the time. And I said, you have to hula. And if you've ever seen real hula, it's pretty impressive. And she said, no, I can't do it. I said, please, would you please do it? And so we ran the two cameras, and she stood in front of this white seamless and gave us the most beautiful hula dance. And I don't know what we'll do with it, but we have it. And that was so exciting, just to say, you know what? I know you can do this. We have the ability to, do, to shoot this. And she said, OK. So if you find things while you're making something else, grab it. Capture it. You'll be amazed what you can do with it later. From one dyslexic to another, this is awesome. <laughs> your, your life learning uh, passion is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, I have a couple, couple questions. Um, so you talked about story in the beginning. Of course, it's, it's essential to everything you do. It's essential to life, really. And I wonder, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was Plato that said there's only six stories in, in life. That's right. Do you believe that, or do you think there's far more than that? Or what's, what's your point of view on that? I think all stories can be broken into genres. And in fact, that's a really helpful thing to do. And in classic theater, when in old England, when, when you watched Macbeth, it was not Macbeth. It was the tragedy of Macbeth. And it set you up as a viewer, before you'd ever gone in there, to know what you're going to watch. And when you do that, it gives you the ability to kind of find your market, find your voice, and be clear about what story you're going to tell. So for example, uh, The Labor of Love. That's really a love story. I mean, all of that starts from two people that met and did what they weren't supposed to do. They fell in love. And they started this venture together. So if you look at things from tragedy, love story, body film, I mean, there's, there's these small compact genres. It really helps you figure out which way you want to go with your story. So yes, are there combinations of that, like romantic comedy or dark comedy? Sure. There's crossovers, but they all come from the core. And you can almost think about it as a Venn diagram where they cross over a little bit. But I do. And I think the fun thing is you can play with that to your advantage. And in fact, we'd have, if we had more time, I would show you this. But I'll, I'll give you the link, alonetimefilm.com. If you guys want 10 minutes. OK, it's a 10-minute film, just so you know. We made this film la not this past fall, the fall before. We shot it in New York City in the Adirondacks. And it's a really beautiful tale that has something more to it. And on your point, we set it up to be one thing, and it turns out to be something else. So when you use convention, people think they're going down one road, and you spin it. And that's when things, to me, become really interesting as a storyteller. So. Yeah, please. And, and, yeah, we can do more. But if you want to stay, we'll play that last. It's, it's really fun. Well, it was interesting when you, you referenced the, uh, the labor of love as a, as, as a point in, the, in the storytelling. Because that, that was an example where I wanted to ask you about what's your, what's your point of view on, on editing and your involvement in it? Because there's always debates in a lot of different kinds of art forms. Like yeah. With uh, Abaddon, there was a lot of people were, that were like, 
who's really the artist? He had a retoucher that he worked with his sure. whole career. Sure. And if you looked at his images and what the re what they looked like after the retoucher got in there, a lot of people were like, well, who's really the artist here? Right. But anyway, they, and to me, that's almost like editing. So I'd love your giving that. The labor of love piece was so much about how that story was edited that Absolutely. made them interesting. So do you? Are you an editor? Are you? Like, I am not an editor. I edit, but I am not an editor. And I say that because. Ultimately, I think that film is the most collaborative form of art. And so for me, I would prefer to tell a story and set a stage and then get the hell out of my own way and let somebody who comes into it with fresh eyes have a whack at it. And sometimes I'll look at it and say, that's not going the direction we need to. And then we steer it in the direction it needs to go. But I think, for me at least, there's some people that can sit in a dark room and look at images that they shot and emotions that they captured and cut it into the, what they think. And I think that that's a wonderful art, but I think also that collaboration with somebody else who can bring a whole other texture to it that you, would, you just don't have in yourself because we're all so different. If you can find somebody you can work with or a group of people that can take your vision and up it a notch, then I think you actually find the art where both people provide their own uh, expertise and their own vision. And just like the retoucher, retoucher, the photographer had the story, had the moment, set the scene to tell the story. And the retoucher, if they're doing their job, augments it. But you're right. Some retouching, they basically go, oh, great, you took this picture, but I'm going to Frankenstein in this head, and I'm going to bring this car in that was never there. And then you're right. That's a totally different, that's, that's the retoucher's story that happens to use elements that the photographer took. But uh, hopefully they work in concert. And hopefully they choose the single voice and move towards it. Come on. Come on. Questions, let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Ted Nugent. Ah, yes. Uncle Ted. Hanging out at Ted Quarters for six weeks in Texas. <laughs> Funny enough, Ted Nugent is an extraordinarily interesting guy. But I said to him during the middle of this, you know, Ted, the, the thing that's amazing is that you haven't made a piece of music that anybody knows about for 35 years, and you're still a household name. And he looked at me and goes, you got a camera, I got a face, let's go. And you realize he's a performer. He was a performer as a guitarist. He was not a great guitarist. He was a good guitarist. But he was a showman. And he's still a showman. And all of his wacky political things are in part to keep him in the limelight. He makes his money by making crazy allegations. And he's good at it. And I don't agree with him, but I'm like, damn, well done. I mean, he, he's, he's an actor. Yeah. I was going to say, did you work with him before all that stuff happened, or was that after? Uh, which stuff? Because there's well, been. So well, what, I don't know, like the most recent political uproar he caused? Uh, he, he, you know, the, that's the funny thing. There was one I know he said something about shooting Obama yeah, or. Yeah. Exactly. That was much more recently. This was probably six years ago or something okay. like that. But it, it's perfect, Ted, because he realizes that he makes emotional uproars with people by prodding, you know, but that's how he makes his money. That's how he gets endorsements. That's how the NRA and all these other companies say, here, here's money. Go out and say what you mean. He's an actor, just as Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh, just so you know, was a sportscaster in Sacramento. And he wanted to go somewhere. So what did he do? Made a political thing. He's an actor. Yeah. I guess it's not really necessarily something you can answer. But do you think he, like, do you think his entire music career then, too, made him? Was he an actor the whole time? Or do you think it was just it's now he's trying to get money and picking up on it? I think he was always a showman. Yeah. He was he was good at making but what we remember like three songs, Cat Scratch Fever, um, Running Wild was one of his songs. And but he was really known for his stage performance. You know, the, the thing that took him over the top was when he swung on a rope from the back of the house all the way up onto stage with nothing but a loincloth. <laughs> and the funny thing is I've seen the footage. He just grabbed on the damn rope. There was no safety anything. People were like, what the hell are you doing? And he went, yeah over everybody and he said he got over the stage he's like oh damn that's way up there and he just let go and dropped like 15 feet and he landed thankfully on his feet but he's like I don't know what I was thinking but it made a mark <laughs> other questions okay you want to watch this okay so uh, yeah please feel free to, to take off if you need to this became the num one of the most viewed, to, to date, one of the most viewed short films on Vimeo. We released this, and it's now gotten close to 700,000 views, which for a short film is 
pretty spectacular because short film is still a very difficult medium because people don't know how much time they want to spend watching it. So I'm going to actually try to go right to the source rather than online. Let's see if it finds it on here. If not, I'll play it from this. So, wonderful actress, first time in film. Rose Hemingway comes from Broadway. She starred opposite Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter, and Darren uh, Chris from Glee. And she was managed through uh, Zach Guilford, who was in The River Wye, his manager. That's how we needed, we, we actually had uh, Bono's daughter set to star in this, Eve Hewson. And she was in another film, and she was at school at NYU, in film school, and she said, a week before we were going to shoot this, I have to back out. And we thought, oh my god, this is terrible. And so, having that network in place, I saw that this one person on her resume, through this manager that I knew, and I asked him, I called him and said, tell me who you got. And he said, I've got three different people. And I was waiting for him to describe her to see what he said, and he said, the most talented out of all of them, Rose Hemingway. And you don't make it in musical theater, which is what she was on Broadway, without having chops. Because there's a lot of actors and actresses that yesterday were flipping burgers and today are actors. They don't have what it takes with the kind of work ethic to get things done until they realize how hard it is. And so we knew working with her, she would go the extra mile, and she did. So Rose's first film, one of the most watched on Vimeo, and this is Alone Time. Alone time. <laughs> so that was a classic bait and switch, where we set you up to feel like, oh, isn't it nice that she's getting perspective, and she's really getting beat down. She's very lonely, and you think the story is going one way, and then the whole story flips. And if you noticed, there's some Easter eggs, as we call them in there. What did you guys see, just out of curiosity? The guy in the train, they're on the train. Yeah. Right? Did you see the other guy crossing the street? Yeah, yeah there was that one shot, like you wanted it to focus on her and follow her. She crossed right. the street, but there was like a dude, guy that's watching her. And so if you notice the zipper, when she goes to bed, zips one way, and it zips the other way when she wakes up. And so the zipper ends at her boots, and in the morning it ends on the other side. And so this was really just an exercise that we wanted to take in making really engaging short form film that could be a larger kind of platform to launch feature film. And so it's, it's done amazingly well. And now the Weinstein Company is interested in making this into a feature. And so we're trying to work on the script right now to take it to a feature length. And uh, that's what happens. That's what happens when you, you, you can see that's very far from ski movies that I started out making. And it's just learning, no film school. It's just always challenging and it's tough. It's tough, I, and I would say, I'd, I'd do it again, if I knew what I was gonna do, I would have done film school. I would have taken that, but film school alone will not make you a success. You've gotta go out and live, and you gotta react, and you gotta absorb and observe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again. Really good. <laughs>